Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight for our webcast, Taking the Teeth Out of Canine Distemper Virus. I'm Jesse Collins, Education Specialist with Maddie's Fund. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Sandra Newberry. Dr. Newberry is currently the director of the University of Wisconsin Shelter Medicine Program. She helped build the UC Davis Court Shelter Medicine Program and served for six years on the board of directors of the Association of Shelter Veterinarians. Dr. Newbury's focus is on partnerships among shelters, veterinarians, and the community, aiming to decrease shelter intake and improve health, welfare, and positive outcomes for homeless animals. She is giving a fantastic presentation tonight, so get ready. Before we start, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen, where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you can ask questions throughout the presentation. There is a certificate of attendance for attending this live event, which you can access in the resource widget at the bottom of the page. Veterinary professionals will only receive their race-approved certificate by attending the live event. The race-approved certificate is not available for people viewing this presentation on demand. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours, should you wish to view it again. Dr. Newbury, thank you for being here tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, I am presenting to you tonight from the romantic candlelit uh, confines of my office. I have no power. So you will be hearing me asking to have the slides advanced. I'm looking at the slides on my own computer, and uh, Lynn Fridley will be advancing slides for me. We're hoping my phone will hold out, and uh, let's just take it from here. So I'm happy to be here tonight. We have been uh, really working hard on canine distemper virus in the last five years, and um, especially so, I would say, in the last couple of years, we've been really learning an enormous amount of information, so I'm excited to share that with you. We've made a huge amount of sort of positive progress in terms of uh, management and life savings surrounding canine distemper virus. So we can go to the, the second slide. I wanted to start out by thanking Maddie's Fund and the ASPCA for funding the diagnostic testing um, over the, the last couple of years, especially. We've been working with a lot of shelters um, working through outbreaks in um, incredibly life-saving ways, uh, finding whole new strategies for how to approach outbreaks and as well as really individual animal illness and finding that uh, even though canine distemper is a really serious and significantly life-threatening disease, um, that we can approach it in ways where the number of, of positive outcomes just shine through. And so that's been really, really exciting. Uh, let's go to the next one. So tonight what I'm going to do is kind of go through uh, all the way from the very basics of kind of what canine distemper is, all the way through some of the new information that we have um, for how we can manage things. And I'm really happy to take your questions, so please make sure that you put your questions in and um, we can stop for questions if they're, they're uh, things that are confusing as we're going, and I think we'll have time for questions at the end as well. So canine distemper virus, it's an enveloped RNA virus. And, you know, when I was in veterinary school and people started talking about things like that, it was like, oh, my gosh, why do we have to learn that piece of information? Well, the things that are important about that is that if a virus has an envelope, it can't survive without its envelope. And envelopes are actually really pretty easy to get rid of. So enveloped viruses are usually easy viruses to kill, and thank goodness that's true of canine distemper. It's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from a parvovirus. Um, almost any disinfectant will, will get rid of it. Uh, dogs and ferrets are susceptible to it, uh, raccoons and other wildlife species as well. It is not the same as feline distemper, so we hear people say sometimes that Kittens have distemper, or cats have distemper, and it's really important to recognize that's really not a distemper virus at all. Um, that is panleukopenia. Um, when people say that, that's usually what they mean, and panleukopenia is itself a parvovirus, so it's much, much more like canine parvovirus than it is like canine distemper virus. 
uh, clinical signs that we can see. Um, we can see those clinical signs in an individual animal. And then often we'll talk about either, you know, kind of group signs. I joke sometimes and say, well, what about the herd signs? Um, and so we're going to talk through all those different things that we might see in an animal, absolutely no signs at all. So we might see infected animals um, that don't have any clinical signs. Uh, we might see subclinical or inapparent infections in that way. There can be a really wide range of affected systems. It's a... It's one of those um, illnesses that when people are in vet school, if they haven't seen canine distemper, and this was certainly the case for me, um, that people will really worry, oh, I might, I might not recognize it when I see it because it can affect so many different systems and present in so many ways. Uh, it does have a really incredible range of severity, too, all the way from hardly any clinical signs uh, to neurologic uh, seizures and death. Um, so that's that's important to recognize. One of the things that I think is really big news uh, for me in working through the outbreaks we've been working through over the last uh, couple of years is that it turns out, uh, you know, with with uh, good supportive care and treatment, and we'll come back around to that a little bit. Actually, most dogs, many dogs, and in most cases, most dogs will actually survive. Um, We'll come back around to this again as well, but once the once the disease has progressed to neurologic signs, the prognosis drops significantly. But for dogs who um, who are really only primarily in the respiratory stage of things, many of those, and in fact, in what I've seen, is that most of those dogs will recover, and that's a real difference from what you see in a lot of the literature, and it's a real difference. Um, for me in what we thought when we initially started uh, sort of working with canine distemper, especially in animal shelters. So the kind of keynotes that people think of when they hear canine distemper are the neurologic signs, and those can be anything from kind of a grand mal seizure to what we call a chewing gum seizure, which is kind of like a little twitching um, in the jaw, and what it looks like is a lot like chewing gum. Um, we can also see these ocular signs that are squinting or blinking um, that can come from uh, uveitis, um, or we can also see sometimes ocular discharge that looks like uh, what we would see, especially like in a cat with, um, with a URI um, that we're seeing in a dog uh, instead. And as I said, uh, the prognosis falls once the neural signs develop. So sorry, I forgot to ask to have the slide advanced to that neurologic and ocular sign slide. I'm keeping um, up with you, Sandra. Um, thank you so much. Um, and so with this dog, I'm not sure how well you can see um, on your screens, but this dog has really the kind of classic squinty, looks like his eyes hurt, looks like he's got a headache is the, the way I sort of think about these dogs looking. Um, and, uh, and these dogs really don't feel well. Um, let's go to the respiratory disease slide. Um, so we can see nasal and ocular discharge. We can see sneezing, coughing, uh, trouble breathing. I included a picture of this dog because I really want you to see this dog is not a dog who's pulling on his leash. His stance and his lowered head, what he's trying to do is, is breathe. He's really uncomfortable. It's difficult for him to breathe, and they will often um, sort of develop this kind of way of standing. So if you see this, um, in the kennels, again, this is not something that indicates, oh, that dog has distemper, but it is something where you want to check into what's going on because the dog is very likely having a difficult time breathing. When you're seeing um, a lot of cases of pneumonia, canine distemper should certainly pop up onto your list of, of possibilities. Um, and sometimes the pneumonia is directly related to the canine distemper. Sometimes what we see is a secondary pneumonia that develops um, many people don't think about this, but canine distemper is a very significantly immune suppressive disease. And so we can often see the dogs developing a secondary, really severe secondary pneumonia um, because they don't quite have the immune function that they need to fight that off. Let's go to the next slide. 
The other big thing that we can see uh, with canine distemper is gastrointestinal disease. Um, that's the biggest one probably that we see as the cofactor. So uh, kind of the hallmark that people think of is neurologic disease. Much more common in shelters is the respiratory disease uh, without the neurologic disease. And um, gastrointestinal is probably next up where we'll see GI signs like diarrhea, uh, probably the most common, sometimes vomiting. One of the things that, again, is kind of a hallmark is when you see dogs waste away in a way that seems sort of seemingly impossible how quickly they can lose condition and lose body, body mass. Um, and so that's another thing that should really kind of um, raise your suspicion and, and have you worry about canine distemper. We can sometimes see a, a pustular dermatitis. This happens uh, commonly, more commonly in puppies. It's not a super common thing, um, but it is definitely on the list of things where I get emails from shelters saying, hey, we have this group of puppies. They had URI. Now they have this rash on their belly, and I get that sinking feeling. Um, and, you know, so then we start looking into it further. Um, uh, hyperkeratosis, which is kind of a thickening of the skin. Um, on the feet, this is called a hard pad disease that we can see in dogs that have had distemper. It's usually something that develops a little bit later, and we can also see something like that happening on their noses as well. Let's go to the next slide. The, one of the things that I think is really important, especially for shelters, is to be able to recognize what the group signs of this disease are. And um, because you may see it in an individual animal, and it may even sometimes go unnoticed in an individual animal. But what we're looking for is an unusual or high number of dogs affected with something that looks like kennel cough. Um, pneumonia in your in your population or pneumonia in your dogs. Um, you know, that's somewhat frequent. Some dogs that progress to neurologic disease, and usually the dogs that you'll see that progress to neurologic disease really sadly are the puppies, will come back around to that. So one of the classic kind of shelter signs of a, of a problem with canine distemper is a shelter that tells me they have a lot of regular kennel cough, and every now and then they have a puppy that gets kennel cough who goes on to become neurologic. Um, that's a real red flag kind of herd sign for us. Uh, Post-adoption reports of neurologic disease because often it takes a little bit longer for the neurologic disease to develop. And so even though, oh, you know, they had a respiratory disease, they recovered, and then they get adopted and, and go on to develop neurologic disease, that's one of those things that makes us really start to worry um, none of these things, just so we're clear, none of these things alone says to us, oh, there's, there's canine distemper in this shelter, but any of these things together are things that should um, kind of raise your index of suspicion and, and have you check into things a little bit further um, to figure out if that is the problem um, or, or a, a source, at least, of the problem that you're seeing. Let's go to the next one. Um, canine December has about a one to six week incubation period. And um, this is a slide that I've, I've actually changed since I've given this presentation more recently because we used to think that the most common onset of illness was a little bit later, around three weeks to five weeks. But in my experience in the last couple of years, what we're really seeing is that the the onset of illness comes a little more quickly than that. So the most common time is probably anywhere from about a week and a half to two weeks up to about four weeks, but we still do know that it can be as long as a six-week incubation period. What we usually see or don't see, um, as I'll explain, is that there's a fever spike about three to six days post-infection. Most of the time, that little fever spike is missed because it's very short and it usually resolves fairly quickly. And so it's not until a little bit later that the signs of respiratory disease develop, and that's when people start to notice that there's something wrong. Um, transmission, uh, it's a very, very highly contagious disease. The real root of infection most commonly is direct from dog to dog. Um, Aerosol transmission is a reality. 
And fomite transmission is also a possibility, but remember, as I said, it's a reasonably easy virus to kill. So if you're following good practices in terms of trying to control fomite transmission, um, that kind of transmission is, is a little bit less likely. When I say fomite transmission, what I'm talking about is the virus traveling from one dog to another dog on your hands, on your shirt, on a piece of equipment. Environment is a little bit less likely, again, because it's easy to kill in the environment, but you do need to disinfect. So even though almost all standard disinfectants are likely to kill the virus, um, you do need to do some careful disinfecting. Um, there is no zoonosis with canine uh, distemper, so it's not a, a virus that humans can catch from dogs. Let's go to the next one. Uh, as I said, direct is the most common means of transmission, and it's important to really think about how do you define direct transmission. I included this picture because this is, you know, somebody might look at a kennel map of the shelter and think, well, that dog was never in the same kennel as those other two dogs. Um, but if we're tying dogs out and we're allowing any kind of nose-to-nose -nose contact, then that's something that does allow for direct transmission. So in properly used housing, especially housing where the guillotine doors are down and, and each dog only has one compartment so you can't move them from side to side to clean, put shelters more at risk of that kind of transmission. Tie-outs for cleaning put shelters more at risk. Um, yards during cleaning, if, if you've got yards where all the dogs are touching noses, Again, it puts you more at risk. I want to be really clear. I'm not saying that I don't think shelters should have playgroups. Um, I'm an enormous fan of playgroups. I just think that shelters should be screening for clinical signs of disease and doing a great job vaccinating dogs on intake um, to figure out who's going to go out into the playgroup. So um, just to be clear about that, we'll kind of come back to that a little bit too. As I said, aerosol transmission is a reality. We've known that for a long time, um, that uh, canine distemper in a big dog is able, you know, a cough from a big dog is able to send that virus about 20 feet um, by aerosol transmission. Even though we know that's true, um, what we've seen in practice is that aerosol transmission doesn't seem to play as big a role as you might expect it to, given that we have this research that shows, um, you know, that this kind of transmission is possible. Um, we've worked with lots of shelters that have been able to isolate um, infected dogs and sick dogs in one area of the shelter without seeing that there is a huge risk from the aerosol transmission. So. Um, in an ideal world, you would protect both from direct transmission and from aerosol transmission. But in the imperfect world that we all live in, um, what we've found is that controlling for direct transmission um, and fomite transmission can often be good enough. Um, so that's just sometimes we like to say, you know, well, here's what we really want, and then if we really can't get it, what are the other choices? Um, let's go to the next one. Fomite is definitely reality over short distances, and so we really want to think about that when we're thinking about staff and volunteer handling. And so, again, if we're trying to isolate dogs for canine distemper, we'll come back to this, but we want to make sure that the staff that are handling the dogs that are infected or might be infected are being extra careful not to handle any other susceptible dogs, uh, to have a change of clothes, wash hands, all of those things are, are super important. Lynn is going to try her best to do this, uh, this click through animation for me. The idea here with this environment and the, the co-mingling is to really think about what happens if you have only one dog in a run, you would think of the exposure risk as just being one. The minute you put a second dog into the run, now the exposure risk for both dogs goes to two. So both dogs have an exposure risk of two. You add a third dog, now the exposure risk goes to three. And so that goes on. Say you have five dogs in a run. That's great. So now you get up to an exposure risk of five. And let's say one of those dogs has canine distemper. 
even if the other four dogs all leave, the exposure risk in that kennel stays at five. And if you add a new dog to that kennel, the new dog will pick up the exposure from the other from the dog who was there. And so, by having this kind of random commingling, where you never bring the exposure risk in that kennel back to zero, you increase the risk of distemper. And this one, I've, I tried to include this one because this is one of the biggest risk factors that we see. Um, the importance of singly housing animals, especially until their vaccines have had a chance to take effect, can't be overstated. It's a really, really important strategy for managing um, populations of, of dogs in, in animal shelters to avoid kin and distemper. So does that mean you can never co-house dogs? No, absolutely not. You can co-house dogs that come in together because their exposure risk is already the same. You can co-house dogs after they've had a chance for their vaccines to work. That's one strategy. But again, in doing that, what you want to do is co-house dogs because it's better for the dog, not because you don't have enough space. So we prefer and recommend that you manage your space with good population management, matching your intake to your possible outcomes as best you can, um, rather than thinking that the, the kind of way I would say it is co random commingling or putting two dogs together that really um, is not in their best interest is not a way to save a life because what happens is you increase the risk of infectious disease for everyone in your shelter by doing that. And so we've got lots of shelters that have worked through that process and, um, and came out on the other side really realizing how beneficial it is um, to get each dog in their own housing unit. Viral shedding um, is a really, really tricky thing uh, with canine distemper. So we can have in a parent or subclinical shedding in dogs who are exposed and also in dogs that are recovered. Um, Post-recovery shedding is usually less than about four to six weeks. Um, but with some dogs, that post-recovery shedding can go on for a really long period of time. And so we like to warn shelters that that's a possibility even though in most cases it doesn't happen, but we do have some dogs that we're still following. There are some dogs who um, continue to be PCR positive for really long periods of time. Um, we're in the middle of kind of doing some research trying to figure out, do those PCR positives still pose an infectious risk? And we don't have all the answers to those questions at this point. Um, it is a rare but very real issue, um, and, and we're hoping that we'll have some more answers to those questions in, in the year to come. But for right now, um, the infectious potential is unknown for these really long-term shutters. It's thought to be low, but our recommendation still is to take those very seriously and continue to keep those dogs away from susceptible dogs. Um, until we have uh, negative PCR testing. We will come back and talk a little bit about PCR in a bit. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a little bit of lab results from uh, antibody testing that we did from some shelters. Uh, what we did is we looked at a few different shelters in different communities, and we did some blood testing as the dogs were coming into the shelter so we could see how many of the dogs were susceptible as they were walking into the shelter. And what we found is that it varies really largely by community. Um, the response to canine distemper is primarily what we call a serologic response. So antibodies in your bloodstream or in the dog's bloodstream is what's responsible for clearing the virus. And so if animals have really good levels of antibodies in their blood already, which they get either from previous exposure or from vaccination, they will be protected from the, from the virus. Um, what we saw was a 64% susceptibility to canine distemper virus in some communities, and in other communities we saw as low as like a 20% susceptibility to canine distemper virus. So it's really important to, 
to understand that lots and lots of dogs coming into animal shelters may actually not be protected for canine distemper. And this is one of the biggest reasons that we so strongly recommend that shelters vaccinate on intake. Puppies under 16 to 20 weeks of age should always be assumed to be susceptible um, even though many of them will be protected. I'm going to come back and talk about that more specifically in just a couple of slides. Um, but it's because of maternal antibodies. They have maternal antibodies that may interfere with our ability to successfully immunize them when we vaccinate them. So let's go to the next slide. And, you know, I included this slide. The dog on the right, the older dog, is actually my dog. Um, who was a lucky dog. He ended up in a shelter that vaccinated him on intake at 10 months of age. He came to my house. He spent his entire life protected from distemper, um, really because he received two vaccines early in his life. I was working on an outbreak with a shelter, and they sent me some of the pictures of the dogs who were infected, and this little, this picture of this little pup came through. And it really struck me at how luck plays out for different animals. This little pup ended up infected with distemper, and she survived. But I really wanted to show just the luck of the draw is really like whether or not you get vaccinated is so incredibly important. Here's two dogs. They look the same. They, you know, share so many of the same things. They both turned up at shelters. One turned up at a shelter where he was lucky and he got vaccinated on intake. The other one showed up at a shelter where she didn't get vaccinated on intake and she actually also happened to be in a young age group where she ended up susceptible to the disease. And so this is my slide as a means of really talking about how incredibly preventable this disease is. So let's go on to the next slide. Canine distemper virus vaccine is one of the best vaccines we have going. It is not quite a magic bullet, but it's as close as we can possibly get. Um, we are so lucky to have a great vaccine like this. All of the major manufacturers make canine uh, distemper virus vaccines that are about equivalent in terms of their efficacy, and they are all really astonishingly efficacious. We have research to show that the, that the vaccine starts to become at least partially effective within four hours of administration. And there's really no other product that we know of that, that we see that kind of rapid response. Um, one thing that's important to understand with that vaccine and that early onset is that it doesn't, that early onset of protection is just a partial protection that protects uh, from development of neurologic disease and death. What it doesn't protect from is infection. And what we often will see in shelters that vaccinate on intake and then expose the animals within the first three days is we see dogs that um, many of the dogs will get what looks like kennel cough symptoms. And this is what I was talking about where we'll see a shelter where most of the dogs develop kind of kennel cough symptoms, but then the puppies who we couldn't necessarily effectively immunize because of their maternal antibodies, those puppies will go on to develop neurologic disease. And so that's where that kind of red flag situation comes from. It's a magic bullet, but not quite, because you can't vaccinate a dog on intake and then immediately put them into a kennel with another dog who has distemper. That won't work. They'll still go on and get infected because the vaccine can't work that quickly. And because it provides this partial protection, even though the dogs don't look like they have canine distemper, they may be infected with canine distemper. And so they may become an ongoing situation in the shelter where you're vaccinating dogs on intake, exposing them. And so large numbers of dogs in the shelter can be shedding uh, canine distemper, even though they're only getting mildly ill. Uh, Vaccine handling is also incredibly important. So it's a great vaccine, but remember what I said about how easy it is to kill this virus. So this is the virus that's going to die in your, in your um, multiple vaccination, in your combo vaccines. If you mix it up way before use, if you allow it to sit out at room temperature, if you allow it to, you know, sit out in the sun and you're in a hot climate, 
Um, this is the virus that's going to die first, and then when you go to give that vaccine, that's the component that's not going to work as well. So vaccine handling is really most important for CDV compared to any of the other components in your vaccine, and that's kind of your drawback of having a virus that's easy to kill. Uh, let's go on. Uh, time to onset of immunity. So I'm talking about, you know, we can see this great um, partial protection start to develop even four hours after vaccination. We've known that for a long time. Sterile immunity for most adults and susceptible pups develops in about three to five days. Again, that's really phenomenal. Um, we're so lucky that we have vaccines that can work that well. But remember, that's what develops if they're not exposed before then. So the importance of vaccinating dogs and then keeping them protected from exposure early in their shelter stays, again, can't kind of be stressed enough. So here's some of the research on the vaccine. This is a study that was done um, way back in 1967. Um, 21 susceptible puppies and 10 litters were vaccinated with a single dose of combined um, vaccine. Uh, they were exposed to the virus and only one of 21 vaccinated puppies became ill and 14 out of the 16 non-vaccinated litter mates died. So, and these are puppies who were immediately, simultaneously introduced into this contaminated environment. So this is how incredibly well that vaccine can work. And I include this study because I think this study comes sort of as close as we can come to sort of replicating a shelter-like situation. Um, and it's just important to know this part of, of the information I'm giving you, this is not new information. This is, you know, we've known this. Um, for almost my whole life. Um, here's a newer study that was done at University of Wisconsin by Ron Schultz um, using the Recombitec vaccine, which is the newer, um, a newer vaccine, and he saw the exact same thing where he said he wanted to know will one dose of vaccination um, given four hours before being placed in a room with other dogs who were shedding the virulent virus be protected, and all of those vaccinated puppies were protected um, within, you know, with with a single dose of vaccine given four hours before intake. So pretty phenomenal vaccine, vaccines and, and great research to show how well they work. Let's move on. Um, so we've got this chart now, uh, the problem with puppies. And this is something that's really important for people to understand when it comes to vaccinations. So we've got this great vaccine. When we give it to an adult dog, we really can expect with one, with one vaccination that we should expect that the animals will have a great response to that vaccine. Within three to five days, they probably have a complete protection against canine distemper. The problem is with puppies. Puppies up to about 20 weeks of age may have maternal antibodies that interfere with that vaccination. And basically the way I like to think about this is kind of like Pac-Man, that the antibodies in their system, the antibodies came from their mom, the antibodies in their system, when we give that vaccine, the antibodies see the vaccine and they kind of just gobble it up and get rid of it. And so the puppy's immune system really never has a chance to respond. And so what's happening in this chart, and it's hard a little bit for me to explain it without pointing to things, but this top black line that you're seeing is the minimum titer to block virulent virus. So it's the minimum level of antibodies that the puppy might have um, that would block real virus. So it would, if the antibody titer is above that black line, then the puppy's not going to get sick, even if it meets real virus. The purple line that's kind of going diagonally across the chart is just a random puppy's antibody titer. So we don't know what any particular animal's antibody titer is, but we're going to say for this, for the case of this discussion, we're going to use this purple line and say this is some puppy's antibody titer. The bottom black line is the minimum number, minimum level of antibodies that would block vaccine virus. And so hopefully what you appreciate as you're looking at the chart is that it takes fewer antibodies 
you can have fewer antibodies and still block the vaccine, but you need more antibodies to be able to protect you from the virulent virus. So let's go through an example. If we say at four weeks of age, we vaccinate the pup. If we follow straight up from the four weeks of age mark here, we can see that oops, it's above the place where the vaccine would get blocked. So our vaccine isn't going to work when we gave it. It's not going to immunize the puppy. But we can say, oh, that's okay, because we're also well above the antibody level where the puppy would be affected by real virus. So then we're going to revaccinate at a two-week interval. So we'll revaccinate the pup again at six weeks of age. And even here, we, we can see, well, the antibody levels are too high. The vaccine didn't get through. But again, it's still okay because even if the puppy meets real virus, the antibodies that the puppy has in its system would protect it and the puppy wouldn't get sick. If we go to eight weeks, this is where we see the problem. And the problem actually starts just before eight weeks. The problem is starting right around seven weeks where what we see is the antibody level is dropping below the level that the puppy needs to protect it from real virus, but the antibody level remains above the level where the vaccine would make it through the maternal antibodies and allow the puppy's own immune system to respond. And so we call this little gray box that's created there the window of susceptibility. And the problem is that we never know where that window of susceptibility is with any particular puppy. And so this is really the reason that we revaccinate puppies at two-week intervals, because we're trying to close this window as closely as we can um, and make it as small as possible. Again, we're lucky because the vaccines that we have now give us only a two-week window of susceptibility. My understanding is this window of susceptibility used to be a much larger window. So when you're vaccinating puppies, know that most of the time you're probably able to protect them. So this is not an argument to say don't bother vaccinating the puppies because lots of time and probably most of the time when you vaccinate the puppies, you are able to immunize them. But sometimes when you're vaccinating puppies, the vaccine that you give is not immunizing the puppy. And so you need to come back and vaccinate again. This is one of the reasons that I use the term revaccination when I'm talking about vaccinating puppies rather than using the phrase booster. A lot of people get really confused by the concept of a booster because they think that they needed to give one vaccine and then the next vaccine makes it more effective that they give the last one. And even veterinarians get confused about this. I'll have people call me and say, oh, that puppy was in the shelter for eight weeks and it got all three of its boosters and then it still got December, there's something wrong with the vaccine. And what I'm hearing when they say that is that they kept the puppy in the shelter all that time and all that time the maternal antibodies that that puppy had that were protecting it faded and went away and the puppy's window of susceptibility opened and allowed that virus to come in. So hopefully that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, please ask questions. It's a complicated um, concept, but it's an important one for everyone to understand. Uh, we'll move on to types of vaccines. The, there's really just two types of vaccines uh, for Canon and December right now. There's a modified live virus product, and that's the product that we recommend for most shelters. There is also what's called a canary pox vector or recombinant vaccine. Um, that's a vaccine made by Marielle called Recombitech. And both vaccines, again, the research I just showed you, both vaccines have been shown to be very effective um, at, at at, at inducing immunity for canine distemper virus. Um, vaccine recommendations are to give either one of those two vaccine products immediately on intake or even sooner. We want you to repeat that at a two-week interval for any puppies who are under 16 to 20 weeks of age. We recommend revaccination post-adoption as a safety net just to make sure just in case there was anything wrong 
um, with the vaccine that was given in the shelter, it's a great idea to recommend to adopters either to do it at, you know, one year of age or any time after puppies are, are adopted from the shelter. We're huge fans of community vaccine clinics. There's everything you can do to induce more immunity in your community will help you um, to uh, avoid outbreaks of canine temper virus. Uh, one really sad outbreak that I just worked on managing was in a community where the um, the city had not given the shelter money to pay for vaccines. And it was really interesting because in that outbreak, almost every dog in the shelter ended up infected with the virus. And so what that tells you is not only was it that the city government itself wasn't prioritizing vaccination, but the community as a whole was also not prioritizing vaccination because all of the dogs that got sick in the shelter weren't protected by vaccinations that their owners had given them before they ended up in the shelter. Um, diagnostics, let's move on to diagnostics. Um, it's a collection really of clinical signs, history, and then also the herd or the group history that really helps us come to understand or to start to suspect um, canine distemper in individual dogs or in an individual organization. We do diagnostic testing once we have that suspicion. And we also try to collect information about what's going on in the community. There are definitely um, some communities that are more at risk of canine distemper than other communities. But also don't let that fool you. Um, you know, the whole time I was in vet school, I heard everybody talk about how, you know, we just don't really see canine distemper up here in the north in Wisconsin. Um, but we've had uh, two of the worst outbreaks that I'm aware of in, in shelters. One was in the city of Chicago and one was in the city of Milwaukee um, because really anywhere where raccoons interact with dogs that are not vaccinated, um, there is a possibility of canine distemper uh, being spread. So please don't um, sort of believe that you're in, an, in a community where you just don't see it, even though in some communities it's it's much less common, you really still can see canine distemper in the shelter. It's important if you're suspicious that you might have a problem with canine distemper is to start to look and evaluate your risk factors, things like no vaccines giving uh, in the shelter late or postponed vaccination. One of the saddest things I see when I work on outbreaks is the dogs who get the outbreaks are always the dogs that there was some reason or another that the dog didn't get vaccinated on intake. Either the owner said the dog was up to date on vaccine or the dog was a little bit difficult to handle or somebody thought that the dog was a little bit sick. So there's really almost no good reason to postpone vaccination on intake. And what I usually say is if you think the dog is too sick to be vaccinated, then they probably are too sick to be in the shelter. <laughs> um, risk factors, having lots of puppies, crowding, uh, commingling in random ways, some in, some out housing. Uh, one of the biggest risk factors we see is minimal or no isolation for respiratory disease. So shelters that are just leaving dogs in place even though they're sick and really not responding by separating sick dogs from the, set, from the general population, we see that um, very commonly in shelters that are having problems with canine distemper. Um, dogs that need to move out of their kennels during cleaning, and also transfers, uh, shelters that are accepting transfers from higher risk shelters. Let's move on. Uh, evaluation of clinical signs. Again, we want to look at uh, illness in individuals and also look at those signs in the group. And then we always want to be kind of asking the question, if we do see illness, is this an individual animal who's sick, or, or could it be this is, this is actually part of a larger outbreak? And so, again, we're looking at the severity of the disease, looking at the ages of the animals that are affected, the numbers of animals that are affected, and kind of the timing of when the animals are affected. We'll come back and, and look at some, some timelines to look at that. Vaccination policies and practices are really important. We rarely see 
significant outbreaks in shelters that are doing a great job vaccinating on intake and not just as a policy, but as a practice. So I've seen lots of shelters who tell us that they have a policy to vaccinate everyone on intake, but then when it really comes down to it, there's lots of dogs that are slipping through the cracks. Um, Huge issue when we're seeing that there's a community problem with canine distemper, then that almost always will kind of bleed over into the shelter. So we want to be careful and, and try to be aware of when problems like that are arising in the community. The kinds of diagnostic testing that we do, uh, we most commonly rely on um, RT-PCR testing um, to look for actual infection in dogs. We have a great partnership with the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab um, for animal shelters. If you're interested in doing diagnostic testing through the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, if you come through our UW Shelter Medicine Program, then you get shelter pricing, which is about half price, um, and we will help you interpret the results that you get. IDEX also has shelter pricing and, and does a great job with the RT-PCR. Less commonly now, some uh, diagnostic labs will use IFA. Uh, it may be a little bit more specific, but it's definitely, it can be less sensitive. Some people like to try to use serology, and you'll definitely see that written in the infectious disease textbook. In our opinion, the serology, especially in shelter animals, is, is best used to evaluate susceptibility or protection um, in a shelter setting. It's a very sensitive test, but it has limited value because you really need to um, watch the change in the antibody levels over time to understand whether the dog was infected or just protected because of vaccination. Uh, negative tests for all of these diagnostics really don't rule out the disease. Um, a positive test pretty much rules it in, and a negative test, if you're still strongly suspicious, we recommend that you test again um, just to see if it happened to be that you got a negative um, that time that you were testing. Let's go to the next one. Lots of people want to know, is that positive from vaccination? And this is a big, big question that we get, especially um, when we're using PCR diagnostics. And even when you get your diagnostics back from the laboratory, you'll often see something at the bottom of the, of the sheet that you got saying to you, oh, you know, this, uh, this positive is within a level that may suggest vaccination. And this is one of those, like for me, kind of a red flag thing in the presentation. So it's something that I hope you'll really take home with you from this presentation, that if the report tells you that the dog is positive and the viral load is low, so that's what they mean when they say it might be from vaccination, please understand that it might be from vaccination, but it also might be from early infection, we can also see a low viral load early in infection. We see low viral loads late in infection. We also see low viral loads um, because we got poor virus recovery or poor sampling. We can also sometimes see a low viral load because of vaccine shedding. So this is something where if you're doing the testing and you have a low viral load that's getting reported to you from your uh, from your laboratory, you want to be sure that you have a veterinarian who's helping you make an assessment of whether you think the dog is a real positive or a vaccine positive. It really becomes a clinical judgment call based on history and context. And sometimes what we'll recommend is to test again in a little while. Um, if it's a vaccine positive, we wouldn't expect that testing a week later would still be positive, whereas if it's a real infected dog, um, then uh, we would expect that, that that positive would remain positive. So just to be clear, there's no direct means to differentiate a vaccine virus versus the field strain with PCR alone. So when you get those reports back, understand that what they're telling you is just that it's a low viral load and that there's multiple reasons that you might see a low viral load coming back on your testing. Um, so again, we might see vaccine interference, so we might see some vaccine virus, which is the modified live virus, shedding in our samples. It's less likely to interfere with testing from swab samples than it is from blood samples. 
it's most likely to interfere. So we might see a vaccine positive one to three weeks post-vaccination. And of course, most of the dogs in animal shelters, if we're vaccinating on intake, are in fact one to three weeks post-vaccination. But remember that vaccine positives, at least in our experience, are fairly rare. So we don't see them too often. And so a good rule of thumb is most of the time, if you're getting uh, positive PCRs back for your canine distemper uh, testing, really take those seriously and, and have a high level of suspicion that the dog may have an infection. Uh, let's move on a little bit. Uh, we can do a CSF antibody detection for testing for canine distemper. Um, again, this is not something that we're going to commonly do in shelter animals. Um, be very cautious if what you're experiencing in the shelter is, is significant neurologic disease because, again, canine distemper is not the only thing that can cause neurologic disease in dogs. Uh, there's a high risk of rabies when you're seeing um, neurologic disease. When neurologic disease develops, even if it's from canine distemper, there's the, the prognosis turns to poor, and we see really significant welfare concerns. So uh, poor prognosis does not mean that every dog is going to die if it develops neurologic disease. We do see many dogs recover, even those who develop neurologic disease. But it's a place where you want to be sure you have veterinary involvement, you want to be sure you have um, supportive care being given and, and have veterinary supervision over the case so that the welfare of the dog is, uh, remains as best it can. Uh, one other kind of diagnostic testing, obviously, is looking at necropsy or histopathology results from dogs who have died. It is often the best way to rule out the disease and can help you evaluate risk for the group. So if you are worried about canine distemper and you're not seeing positives and you do have a dog that dies, it's a great idea to submit that dog to a laboratory for testing. Um, it will also help you explore other potential causes for disease if you're seeing problems. Um, and so, you know, always look into that if you're having deaths uh, that you think might be related. It's a great idea when you're when you're looking at dogs or thinking that you're having problems with canine distemper virus to really think about what the source is for the disease. Is the do you believe that the dogs are coming in and they had community acquired disease and they were you know they were infected when they got to you? Um, do you think that the disease is spreading within your shelter? Um, or is it something where the dog came from another shelter and you believe that the dog got infected at the other shelter? The point for trying to figure this out, of course, is not just casting blame. The idea is to really figure out where you want to target your intervention for making things better and solving problems so that the problems don't continue. Um, one of the ways that you can figure out the source is by looking at the timing for when, when, the, when the disease starts in the dog. And so, again, I'm going back to this chart that we made. We know the most common recognition of signs happens in this kind of week and a half to two week time till right about four weeks. Um, so if what you're seeing is most of your cases are developing um, in this time frame, then probably the infection is happening sometime very soon after intake. If in if alternatively um, the onset of illness is within the first few days or the first week um, in your shelter, then it's more likely that the source is uh, somewhere else other than your shelter, either in the community or another shelter that the dog was in. If the onset of disease is more like, you know, five to six weeks, then it, it's really pretty confirmatory that it's happening within your own organization. And so these are just things that will help you to try to figure out um, what to do in terms of intervening um, and how to solve the problem that, that the dogs are getting infected in the first place. One thing I want to just point out again is just this concept of amplification in an animal shelter. And so if we have a dog come in who's infected, if we just had one dog in the community and that, that dog is all by itself, that dog's not going to spread virus. But if we bring that dog into an animal shelter, then that dog gives his virus to another dog. 
And then that dog can pass that illness to the other dogs in the environment. The great thing about vaccination is that vaccination can sort of put X's on all of these arrows and, and reduce the level of amplification. So if the dogs are immune, then the infectious potential drops really rapidly because you can't get that same kind of spider web effect or that net effect that amplification needs to, to dramatically change that. This is one of the things that we can really tell what communities, in what communities owners are doing lots of vaccination because in a community, for example, the community that I live in, when we do the testing on intake, we see that almost all the dogs are already protected against canine distemper virus. So if a single dog comes into the shelter infected with the virus, the virus isn't going to spread very far. Whereas in some of the other uh, shelters that I work with in different communities, um, if a dog comes in with distemper, the risk is much higher because the community itself is not doing a great job of vaccinating the dogs, and so many of the dogs in the shelter are still susceptible. And we saw that um, in this last year in several shelters, um, so we saw that happening. Again, just I'm putting in a plug that random co-housing increases that risk of amplification because you take the infected dog and directly expose other dogs. And especially if you're doing that right at the point of intake, um, you're doing it before the dogs have had that opportunity to let that vaccine even, even get to its partial protection. Um, whereas if the dog came in and was housed individually, all the dogs have time to develop immunity post-vaccine and, and, and the dogs come out much better. Um, Lynn, I'm going to skip to the prevention slide, if that's okay with you. You can make that work for us. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, so vaccine is a really important piece of prevention, and, and, and along with that is just eliminating all the other risk factors as well. So vaccinate on intake or sooner. Community outreach vaccine clinics are high on the list. Protect your puppies, but get them out quickly. So don't think that you're protecting puppies by either asking a source shelter to hold on to them longer to give them more vaccines because that's actually not protecting them. Getting them out of the situation that's high risk is the best way of protecting puppies. If you have double-sided housing, puppies should be the ones that you're prioritizing in your double-sided housing because it's easier to protect them if you don't need to remove them every time you're cleaning. Isolate or separate sick dogs promptly. Avoid intake co-housing for dogs. Monitor closely for illness. And I can't stress that one enough that the shelters that are recognizing that dogs are sick quite quickly and separating those dogs from the general population are the shelters that have um, a great record of sort of having a sick dog come in, recognizing it, isolating it, and we see that it doesn't spread. Uh, test periodically when clinical signs are indicating it. It's really, really worth it. Uh, through our program, uh, testing for canine distemper virus costs about $20 to $30, and it is money that's incredibly well spent um, because sometimes shelters will try, you know, I'm going to save 20 or $30, but then the amount of money that you'll spend um, responding to an outbreak and the, and the welfare of the dogs and the lives that are lost are not worth not having that piece of information. So please take respiratory disease seriously. So that's kind of what I, that's kind of our basic foundation building blocks of understanding all the factors for canine distemper virus and how it works and, and what, our, what our key sort of preventive strategies are. And now what I want to talk about is how do we respond to illness? Um, prevention is still really the key. So um, I want you to know when I say like, oh, we have all these great possibilities for how we can respond to this virus, we do. It still is a significantly life-threatening disease. And so um, in many ways, you know, we've done a lot of work with ringworm, and with ringworm we've been able to say, you know, we can treat this disease. It is a treatable, curable disease, and very few cats 
um, need to die because they have ringworm. Distemper is treated is is there's not a treatment specifically for distemper. We can support dogs through the viral um, infection, and many dogs will recover. Many many more dogs than we ever thought will recover, but it is still a horrible disease, and many dogs will not recover. Um, and the dogs who don't recover, um, you know, suffer. And so we really want to focus on prevention. It is one of the most preventable diseases that that we experience in animal shelters. And it is as simple as getting these animals vaccinated and protecting them um, long enough to allow their vaccines to take hold. Um, so again, uh, when we're responding, we want to think about individual animal illness, individual health and welfare, group health and welfare. When we're going to make a choice, what are we going to do with this animal now who's infected? We need to think about what is the potential for spread or for an outbreak to occur? What's the potential for this animal to get adopted? Um, what isolation space is available? And do we have the capacity to provide the kind of treatment and supportive care that are necessary? Um, one of the saddest things I've seen is where shelters are really trying to do this, but they don't have veterinary support, they don't have the resources, and so the dogs are really suffering. So please, if you make a choice to try to respond by treatment, make sure you get the support that you need um, to be able to do that and do that well. Um, what are the clinical signs and what are the prognosis in the individual animal? Um, and is that, is treating that animal both in that animal's best interest and in the best interest of the organization? How many other susceptible animals do you have in your population so you kind of understand what the risk is of keeping the dog in the population? And what resources do you need? Um, when you're seeing an individual animal that's ill, you always want to think kind of bigger picture and do you need an outbreak response plan or is this really just an individual animal issue? When we're thinking about responding to, out, to outbreaks, the, the most key concept we can think about is stopping the cycle of transmission. Um, what we want to do, like the very first thing we want to try to do is to stop putting fuel on the fire. So make sure that we're protecting susceptible dogs from whatever else is going on. The problems, and I think about this, I often uh, do an exercise where I have people work through an outbreak by kind of saying, you know, here are the problems, here are the rules. Um, you need to make strategies surrounding these. And um, one of the things we see is that there's a very long incubation period. Remember, there's that six-week incubation period. There's ease of transmission from one dog to the other. The clinical signs, as I told you, often overlap with just canine infectious respiratory disease, so what we think of as kennel cough dogs. We can have reservoir dogs because of that, so we can have a dog that just was mildly ill and then recovered, but that dog is still in its kennel putting out enormous amounts of virus um, into the environment. and um, and if that dog is interacting with other dogs, can be a reservoir for infection. Some puppies and, uh, are going to be susceptible to the virus, and we don't know which one. It, ha it can have a very long recovery period, even though often the dog's clinical signs will recover well before they, they test PCR negative. Some dogs won't. Some dogs will go PCR negative quite quickly. But in some cases, we have these long recovery dogs. And again, resources, all the diagnostic testing um, that's needed and all the resources for treatment and care and um, the kinds of care that will keep your healthy dogs healthy and your sick dogs well taken care of. The, the strategies that we use uh, primarily are referred to as a clean break. Um, and the idea behind a clean break is keeping the new intake and the, and the healthy dogs away from the dogs who are sick or the dogs who have been exposed and are still, um, are still at risk. My, the reason that I say here, please don't do nothing, is that I feel that there are many shelters that um, get very overwhelmed by even thinking about canine distemper virus, and so they don't actually respond. 
Um, and I guess what I want to tell you is there's lots of help out there. And um, Maddie's Fund and the ASPCA have been working really closely with our program in particular to help shelters um, get help for diagnostic testing. So if you feel like you might um, might be having a problem, we really want to stress to you to please don't go this alone. Reach out for assistance. We can't promise you in advance that there'll be funding and assistance for you for diagnostic testing, but in, in most cases, we are able to find assistance for you to help fund the diagnostic testing that you need to get out of the outbreak. Um, what we found is by investing that kind of funding uh, in diagnostic testing for the outbreak that, again, we're coming out of these outbreaks really maximizing the life saving with only, uh, you know, small handfuls of animals that are lost. Um, and that is a really different picture than what we used to see when we managed outbreaks um, where often depopulation was was the sort of chosen path by many organizations because it was too overwhelming and too resource intensive. So get veterinary assistance. Um, our program is, is uh, often available to help with that. Some of the other shelter medicine programs are also available to help. Try to find a veterinarian who can help you uh, locally. Um, that's the best scenario possible. If you think you're having a, a, a problem with disease, communication in your community is incredibly important. Uh, we recommend that you communicate early and often. Ask your community for help and explain the life-saving work that you're doing. Wisconsin Humane Society um, is, for me, kind of the banner example of that. When they had uh, an outbreak about five years ago, they reached out to the community, they explained what was happening, and they asked for help, and the outpouring of help was just phenomenal. And it was such a huge difference from what I've seen in the past where shelters are getting attacked because of their outbreak that they were having. Wisconsin Humane has made um, the press information that they put out available, and several other shelters have used it when they were having distemper outbreaks. And it, it has worked equally well. And so I encourage you to not sort of hold this information on your own. Make sure you let the, the, your community know what's happening, what you're doing, that you're getting help, and, and how you're approaching the situation and that you're hoping for as many life-saving outcomes um, as you can muster. Understanding risk assessment and immunity is, is a really key feature of being able to respond. And so I'm going to walk us through kind of how do we do this. Well, what we, what we try to do is we try to categorize all of the dogs into risk groups. So we designate very, you know, different risk groups. And we base it, on the, we base this idea of designating risk groups on controlled challenge studies that have been done over many years. None of those studies are studies that I've done. Many of them are studies Ron Schultz or other researchers have done. And so we have an idea of what kinds of immunity are needed um, for the dogs to be protected from disease. So let's go on. Uh, risk group evaluation and clean break is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about our response. The general principles, as I said, are to stop the cycle of transmission, Send low-risk dogs. First, we have to identify which dogs are low-risk, and we're going to send them on their way. Then we're going to isolate or separate any dogs that are sick. So first, again, we need to identify those dogs and then isolate or separate. And then we're going to identify which dogs are susceptible. So let's go on. Here is kind of an overview of what we're talking about. And so if we imagine this clean break and we take this big vertical red line, we're going to take any new incoming dogs and we're going to keep them completely separated from the population that's already in the shelter. Um, and so we're going to look at all the dogs that are already in the shelter and evaluate them for clinical signs. This is a great time to get a veterinarian involved to come in and really tell you which dogs have clinical signs of disease and which ones don't. Any dog that doesn't have clinical signs of disease will collect blood to do an antibody titer. We don't run antibody titers on the dogs that are sick because if the dog has a positive antibody titer, 
we can't tell whether that dog is protected or infected. They could have a positive antibody titer from either of those things. What we know from all the research that we've done, though, is that if the dog has no clinical signs of disease and a positive titer, then the dog is very low risk. We don't ever say no risk because biology just isn't perfect in that way. But in general, what we found is that when we see dogs who have no clinical signs and they have a positive antibody titer, that those are dogs that are very, very unlikely to go on and become ill. And so what we can do is we can look at those antibody titers, and in most shelters, especially shelters that are vaccinating on intake, the majority of dogs will fall into that category. And so this has been, over the years, a huge kind of positive thing that we've discovered, that most of the dogs, um, are usually protected. And so there's a huge group of dogs that we can say, you know, go ahead and just get these dogs adopted or go ahead and transfer these dogs out because they have a positive antibody titer. They're not going to become ill. In some cases, some of the transfer groups have asked to also PCR test some of those dogs. And the good thing about doing that is if they have a a negative PCR and a positive antibody titer, then we can be almost certain that that dog is not sick and not going to become sick. Um, if If the antibody titer is negative, then they fall into the higher risk group. Again, it doesn't mean that they're in infected, but it means they were susceptible at the time that they might have been exposed. So now I'm going to just kind of walk us through in a stepwise fashion how we would how we would do this response. So we hopefully we're vaccinating on intake or sooner. We're repeating at two week intervals if puppies are staying that long, getting them out soon as soon as we possibly can. We're evaluating the potential for adoption in all of these guys. We're considering every dog in our current population, and we're evaluating our capacity to provide care for the dog. Um, we're going to implement a clean break, so we're going to take new incoming dogs, separate them from all the exposed dogs. We're going to clean and disinfect whatever area we're setting up as our clean break area before we move dogs into it. Again, this is a relatively easy virus to kill, so you don't need to leave it empty for a number of days. You just need to clean and disinfect the area, and then you can use that as your clean break area. You're going to be uh, evaluating your expected intake to help you figure out how many kennels and how much housing do you need in your clean break area. If you're having a significant problem, you may even want to think about slowing or stopping your intake. Um, We've worked with several municipal shelters who have done a great job communicating to the public and just saying, you know, hey, We're not going to take owner surrenders for a little while. Can you just hold on to your dogs? It's better for your dog not to come into this population while illness is in the population. Again, any commingling that needs to be done because of cage space requirements, you want to plan that out carefully and not have that be random mixing. And then always clean and care for the new arrivals before you're handling or caring for the dogs that are exposed or ill. And if it's at all possible, you even want to have separate staff so that you don't have any of that fomite transmission. Go to the next slide. So the next step would be to go through, evaluate all the dogs for clinical signs. And so you want to very, very carefully look at each dog. Any suspect's clinical signs would put that dog into the high-risk category for respiratory disease any kind of unexplained GI disease. We call it ain't doing right if we see depressed dogs, dogs that aren't eating. Um, We can do PCR testing on these dogs um, that have clinical signs, but remember, even a negative test doesn't necessarily mean that the dog isn't infected or that it's just, it can also be just a point in time, so it might mean that the dog wasn't shedding today but it might be shedding a different day. So that's why we always put dogs who have clinical signs of illness into that high-risk category if we're working on an outbreak response. Sometimes if we're trying to decide if we're actually having an outbreak, then the, the PCR diagnostic testing can help us figure out whether the sick dogs are actually distemper infected or whether they actually 
you know, just have some other kind of more moderate respiratory disease. Step three is to look at antibody titers. And again, we're going to look, we'll try to differentiate the dogs into high risk and low risk groups by using their antibody levels. Remember that we can't evaluate dogs with clinical signs. Um, we can evaluate puppies, and that's a question that a lot of people have. When we do evaluate them, a puppy with an antibody titer that, that's positive, we can't necessarily say whether the antibodies that are there are maternal antibodies or antibodies from active immunity that the puppy has developed on their own. But in any case, if they're at a level that's protective, we consider them to be protective. At the same time, we know that maternal antibodies degrade over time, so if there is a pup that has maternal antibodies now, we want to get that pup moving and get them out of the shelter um, because those, we know those antibodies might drop and that window of susceptibility might open. There's in-house kits you can use for evaluating antibody tests. Both canine vaccine check and symbiotic titer check are tests that can be run in-house. You do need to have fairly experienced technicians or people that are really good at following directions to run them. The cost ends up being approximately $20 per dog. You can also send these into the lab, and the lab can run these tests for you as well. Um, antibody test interpretation, remember positive is a good thing. A positive test for antibodies in an adult dog with no clinical signs indicates low risk. Uh, low risk doesn't mean no risk, but um, it does mean that it's very unlikely the dog will get sick. Uh, so we talked about the puppies. Let's move on to step four. We want to evaluate the risk. So if we're looking at dogs that we're saying, oh, this dog is high risk, then we really want to say, well, how high is the risk? What are the vaccine practices at the shelter? Were most of the dogs vaccinated on intake? The canine distemper titer, it's a little bit ironic because the, um, the vaccine has been shown to work so quickly to provide partial protection, but it does take a fair amount of time for the antibody protection to be detectable by the lab tests that we currently have available. So if we know that the animals are being vaccinated on intake, even if we um, see low antibody levels, we often will um, hope that the animal is a little bit less high risk than an animal that wasn't vaccinated at all. What kind of sanitation practices does the shelter have? Are they commingling? And so we can sort of take all of these factors and put them into this understanding of how we evaluate risk. Let's go on to the next. The next one, step five, is a shuffle. And basically what we're doing is we're taking the dogs that we've identified as being low risk and having them be in one area any of the dogs we've identified as high risk who need some kind of quarantine. Again, usually this ends up being a small number of dogs, so sometimes we can get them out to foster care, sometimes we can get them into different places, and then the sick dogs all need to be isolated um, and separated away from the general population. Uh, let's go on. For, clinic, for dogs who have clinical signs, again, we want to remove or isolate them. We want to carefully weigh the risk of keeping sick dogs in the shelter. Some um, We want to think about can you care for them, how long are they going to need to stay there, and ideally we're going to want to get two negative tests um, before those dogs are released to the general population. Um, for low-risk dogs, so dogs that had a positive titer, those dogs we're going to send home. We're going to inform potential adopters about what was going on in the shelter, but let them know or potential transfer groups that we really don't believe that there is much risk for these dogs. They, if Ideally, we would keep them separate from the clean population, but if we can't, these are the dogs to put with the other dogs that are the new intake because these are the dogs that are very, very unlikely to become ill. High-risk dogs, again, we want to think about all these problems that we have and try to come up with a good solution for these dogs. Um, in many cases, we need to quarantine them. Um, and uh, again, what we find is that these are usually a smaller 
group of dogs, we used to say that these dogs needed to be quarantined for six weeks. Um, but what we've discovered is that if we um, watch these dogs over time and they don't develop any clinical signs, we can repeat the antibody testing along with a PCR. And if they have no clinical signs, they develop a positive antibody titer and have a negative PCR, then they move into the lowest category and, co- and can go on their way. And that usually happens much sooner than six weeks of time. So again, it's a way that we can get the dogs moving through the shelter um, a little bit quicker. People ask a lot of time, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, can you safely send them somewhere else? You really want to prioritize probably the healthy high-risk dogs to go. Um, some shelters can find foster parents for the, for the sick animals, especially for the mildly ill animals. But just remember to really carefully think through what is safe. We only want the dogs to go with well-vaccinated adult dogs. We want them to go with resilient humans because the dogs can deteriorate uh, pretty dramatically. And so we want people to be informed of what might happen. We definitely don't want to send sick or infectious or high-risk dogs into homes where there are puppies, and we don't want to send them to uninformed adopters. Um, I think one of the hardest things for me to think about is depopulation. Uh, When I first started working with shelters a long time ago, um, it was one of the the things that was the most heartbreaking thing that I saw, that many shelters, if they had even a single case of, of distemper, would depopulate their shelter. What we know now from all the work that well, that we've done is that really isn't necessary, and there's a lot of loss of life of dogs who never were really even at risk at all um, when that happened. So we hope you'll do um, a risk assessment rather than depopulation. We hope you'll reach out for help. Um, because when you get that help, you can do the risk assessment. And again, we find that that's a really life-saving endeavor. Um, We hope that uh, whenever shelters are working through problems like this, that in the end, you will develop a long-term response plan. And what I've seen is that I've been so proud of the shelters that I've worked with because many of them, almost all of them, um, after experiencing problems with canine distemper in their shelter, really go on to eliminate those risk factors. They really uh, take that opportunity to affect change in their organization. And almost every shelter that I've worked with through one of these outbreaks has really um, found inspiration in um, in working through that to really change a lot of the underlying factors that allow the outbreak to happen in the first place. And I've even seen whole communities kind of rally around that. And um, it's that in itself has been really, really inspirational. So on our summary slide here, just to kind of go back, it's a lot of information in the last hour, almost and a half. It's one of the most preventable infectious diseases we battle. There is, uh, again, it's something as simple as a very inexpensive vaccine can protect a dog for life and really um, be all the difference in that dog's life. Um, let's all see what we can do to help work towards community solutions that help uh, develop immunity within the community so that when dogs come to the shelter, they're already protected from canine distemper. Uh, Don't wait for an outbreak to put good practices in place. I'm proud of all my shelters that have put those good practices in place following an outbreak. But what I really hope is that you'll get inspired before you ever have an outbreak so that you don't ever have to call and and get help from us. Um, And then please remember, outbreaks can be managed in incredibly life-saving ways. We want to help when that's happening, and we want you to get help when things like that are happening. so, so please reach out for help um, if you feel like you're having concerns with that. Um, with that, we can go to some questions, but I also wanted to say thanks to you guys every day uh, for the work that you do. Um, this is a picture of one of my shelter dogs, and this is the same dog I was showing you before, and just how happy I am that a shelter did the right thing for him. And I think about that all the time for all of you doing the right thing for all the animals that you're taking care of. Thank you so Jesse, much. Jesse, what questions Barry. do we have? <laughs> we do have several <laughs> questions for you. Here's our first question. What two negative tests are needed for shedding period? PCR. 
So, so what we look at uh, to determine that a dog is no longer infectious, what we look for uh, normally is a PCR test and I think we lost Dr. Newberg. Um, Hello? We may be having some difficulties hey. here. <laughs> Looks um, like we did lose Dr. Newberry, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, I um, I have to apologize. Uh, Dr. Newberry, uh, in her area where she lives, up in the northeast uh, or northwest, actually the Midwest, I believe, uh, they had severe storms tonight, and she's been working from her printed slides with no power uh, and her cell phone. So um, I think we're going to have to just get these questions answered um, in a document from Dr. Newberry, and then we'll post them on our website uh, so that you can get your questions answered. And then we'll probably just go on ahead and close for the night. Jesse, do you want to give the audience uh, the, your closing remarks? And um, we appreciate you all attending tonight. Sure thing, Lynn. Um, so that looks like that will be the end of our event tonight. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. As a quick reminder, the race-approved certificate for veterinary professionals will only be given out for those who are attending this live event. The race-approved certificate is not available for people viewing this presentation on demand. Be sure to join us on September 1st for our next webcast. Oh, hello. I'm back. Hi, Dr. Oh, Newberry. sorry about that. Dr. Newberry, you're back. Um, we were just closing <laughs> for the evening. <laughs> okay, well, let's see if our audience is still with us. And, yes, we still have a, quite a few people still on board. So um, okay. let's go to the next question. Great. So our next question is going to be, what kind of community support did the community provide to the HS in Wisconsin? Where can we find those press materials? Um, I can give those press materials to Maddie's Fund, and Maddie's Fund can make them available. Uh, I think that's possible, yes, Lynn and Jesse? Yes. Yes, that should be possible. Okay. <laughs> Great, so we can make those available. And the kind of support they got was financial donations, donations of materials. Um, they got support from local veterinarians and um, uh, all sorts of things like that. So it, it was really fantastic. Great. Um, we're going to move on to the next question now. We currently give shots starting at six weeks of age and then every three weeks for three to four rounds. Are you saying we should be doing a shot at weeks 4.6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16? Uh, that is a great question. So what I'm saying is that the, the and I am saying this, and it's not just me who's saying this, there is uh, the, the recommendations from the American Animal Hospital Association vaccine guidelines um, they now have recommendations specifically for animal shelters, and the recommendation is to start vaccination at four weeks of age and then to give a vaccine every two weeks while the pup remains in the shelter. So what my hope would be is that you would never have a pup that remained in the shelter long enough to give it a second vaccine. I know that's probably not, that's probably too optimistic for many shelters, but uh, again, so we would, if we had a puppy that came in at four weeks of age, we would give a vaccine at four weeks of age, we would give a vaccine at six weeks of age, and then hopefully that pup would be gone by the time we needed to give it another vaccine. If the pup still remained in the shelter, we would give another vaccine at eight weeks of age. So we want to give the vaccine two weeks until the pup is older than 20 weeks of age. But what we really, really want to do is get those pups out of the shelter quite quickly. So we never want to hold on to the pup and keep it in the shelter in order to give it more vaccine. Thank you so much, Dr. Newberry. It looks like we do have time for just one more question. Um, is it reasonable to revaccinate old adult dogs one time at two weeks in high-risk shelters? Um, that is a reasonable thing to do. You can do that. You can also, uh, you know, you can also give 
when you're when you're giving the revaccination at two weeks, just be clear that what you're really doing is giving that second vaccine uh, for the distemper component at least. You're giving that vaccine mostly as a safety net, um, and it's a safety net in case. Um, there was something wrong with the vaccine, the vaccine got mixed up and left out, or it was too hot, or someone gave the vaccine in the fur instead of under the skin. Um, and so we, we really can expect a lot from these modified live vaccines, but it, it certainly doesn't hurt anything but your resources um, to give a second vaccine. Thank you again, Dr. Newbury. And I think that with that, we've reached our time limit. Uh, so that will be the end of our event tonight. Um, again, we want to thank Dr. Newbury and all of you for your time tonight. Um, be sure to join us on September 1st for our next webcast, Fostering Saving More Dogs with Behavioral Challenges with Kristen Arbach. More information on this webcast will be arriving in your inbox soon. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you will share this presentation on your social sites. Thanks again for being here with us this evening, and good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.